His Excellency Ambassador Ralph Kurman, first of all, thank you very much for accepting this interview of, uh, and of course for having us in your residence. Since last year, Kitabustan has started a series of interviews with the ambassadors from developed and democratic countries. So in this regard, Germany holds a special place among the countries we study and we introduce in mm. Kitabustan due to its socio-political structure, economic accomplishments, of course, scientific and technological mm -hmm. advancements and educational benchmarks. So it's hard to imagine the history of world development without Germany. Printing, science, industry, philosophy, almost all spheres of life bear the signature of German people. Accuracy, meritocracy, order, responsibility. It's probably interesting for many people. What is the secret of German thinking? Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm happy to host you here and to participate in this interview. Um, and thank you for your kind words about uh, Germany and uh, German culture and literature. I'm not so sure whether there is a secret I can share with you, but uh, definitely German literature, philosophy, science, uh, also industry and innovation has a long history and it goes back many centuries when Germans developed some of uh, the traditions and the values that are still to be seen today when um, you look at Germany from abroad. And one is, as you mentioned, uh, um, it's it's their hardworking people, their work ethics, um, their accuracy, meritocracy, etc. And a lot of that comes from, let's say, 16th, 17th century of Protestantism, and um, the the co conviction that um, you have to work hard um, to be uh, accepted by God as a good human being. That was a typical Protestant attitude. And then later on, of course, you had uh, Prussia, the, all the Prussian work ethics, uh, people working very hard, being orderly and disciplined, that all kind of influenced Germany and Germans over the centuries. And today, I would say what uh, makes up uh, a major uh, trademark of Germans in the world is that we are a very open society in an open country. About 25% of Germans have a migration background and we are a global economy and a global country firmly integrated into the European Union and open to all kind of influences also coming from abroad. We try to keep our traditions and the culture and the values, but we are also open to adopt new ones because in a world that changes, you have to be ready to change as well. Experience shows that two main factors ensure sustainable development, peace and democracy. Last year, the 60th anniversary of the Yelze Treaty was celebrated, which put an end the long-lasting conflicts between Germany and France. However, it's always difficult to achieve peace other than starting conflicts. But Germany is one of the countries that managed to achieve and preserve sustainable peace. From what did Germany start the peace building mm. process and how was the peace maintained? Maybe I should start with the fact that unfortunately today in Germany and in Europe we do not have and we do not have any more, unfortunately, sustainable peace after Russia's aggression in Ukraine. There is war on the borders of Europe and um, we are confronted with a situation where the whole European peace architecture, the security architecture, is put into question. Um, but coming back to your question, because of Germany's and Europe's history, of endless wars over the centuries and also of many wars between Germany and France alone between 1870 and 1939 Germany started three wars with France two of them 
ended as world wars. So after the end of the Second World War, uh, European leaders were deeply convinced that we have to establish a new peace order in Europe. And at the core of this order were Germany and France. So the leaders of both countries, uh, Konrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle, started a process of reconciliation. And um, it's culminated in the Elysee Treaty, which was uh, concluded in 1963, so this year exactly 61 years ago, and it built the core of the European peace order and a peaceful development uh, within Europe. And if you look at it, it even made the whole European Union a big peace project. And if I may remind you, um, in the year, I think, 2000. 14, the European Union received the Nobel Peace Prize for being the biggest peace project of the 20th century. So at the heart of this peace in Europe lies reconciliation with Germany and France and it all began with the Elysee Treaty. Many countries have their own interpretations of democracy. 35 years ago, democracy emerged victorious of a totalitarianism mm. within the borders of the present-day united Germany. Of course, this was the result of the will of the German people. Today, the collapse of Berlin Wall, which was previously considered a monument of totalitarianism, has become a triumph of democracy. What are the reasons behind the success of German democracy? Mm. And in general, what is Germany's model of democracy? Yeah. Again, I'm not so sure whether Germany can or even wants to be a model of democracy, but our democratic tradition goes back to the 19th century. And our first democratic republic we established after the First World War, very similar to Azerbaijan. The difference to Azerbaijan is that Azerbaijan involuntarily lost its independence only after two years, after it founded an independent and democratic republic, lost it to Soviet Bolshevism. Whereas Germany continued as a sovereign nation, but on the way Germany lost democracy because of the Nazi regime, of authoritarianism rising in the 1920s and 1930s, which ended in a catastrophe for Germany in the defeat and the, the complete destruction almost, I should say, um, of Germany. And um, as we discussed before, in the realization that Germany has to start anew and make democracy uh, the basis of everything that Germany stands for after the wars and in order to end war. Um, completely. So um, we built up a democracy in the west of Germany during the Cold War, whereas East Germany was a totalitarian, a communist uh, regime. And with um, the end of the Cold War and the, and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Germany had the opportunity to reunite peacefully and democratically. So the two Germanys reunited in 1990 on the basis of a democratic constitution. And for Germans, with their own historic experience with democracy and how we lost democracy in uh, the Third Reich, but also in East Germany during the Cold War, we know what it means to, to lose democracy, which is why we are holding very dearly, very closely uh, to this democratic system, which for us is the basis for, for freedom, for human rights and for equality in the society. So democracy for Germany is, is very, very important. And I think it's also very important for, for, for all of Europe uh, and European uh, stability and peace. 
German education system, which gave the world significant figures such as Max Planck, Goethe, Humboldt, Karl Gauss, is in the top 10 in the education index today. What are the main differences of the German education system from other education systems mm. and the main achievements of German education system? Good. Thank you for not asking me about the secrets of German <laughs> education system. Um, again, I would say it's um, yes, there is a long tradition, of course, in the education system. Um, and there are two main features. Uh, first of all, it, it's highly developed, um, which is why many students also from abroad are studying or doing research in Germany. The second is it's basically free of charge which is uh, not common um, in, in most countries. So again, this is um, one reason why many students, also from Azerbaijan, fortunately, come to Germany to study or to do research. And it makes the system very attractive. One special feature maybe about the German education system is uh, our system of vocational training. We call it a dual system of education, which means you have a university study for a profession and you have practical training in a company at the same time, in parallel. It goes on for three years. You um, acquire a degree, a professional uh, degree, which is recognized by the state, which is standardized. And every employer knows if somebody comes um, to apply for, for a job and produces a certificate of the vocational training system, the employer can absolutely rely on the qualification of um, uh, his employee. So this is um, maybe something special in Germany. It's a tradition that goes back 150 years with the beginning of industrialization in Europe. The system was growing. And we have made very good experiences with it. We are cooperating with a number of countries around the world, also with Azerbaijan. We know that it is not possible to just cut and paste our system and, and copy it uh, to, to other countries, but there is lessons to be learned and we are happy to share it also with Azerbaijan. Last year, German's Foreign Minister, Ms. Annalena <coughs> Berberg, has introduced a new feminist foreign policy guidelines. In parallel, the Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development has also announced a new strategy on feminist development assistance. Mm -hmm. According to the Foreign and Development Ministries, the German government aims to provide 12 billion euros in aid to projects mm -hmm. designed to combat gender inequality. How would you explain German government's gender equality policy? Well, first of all, I should say and remind all of us, half of the world's population are women. So, equality, equal opportunities, justice in society for all and everyone is very important. It lies at the heart, at the core of, of every society. What we call a feminist foreign policy or the feminist development policy should not be misread as um, a policy by women for women. Uh, and although women are the main target of a feminist foreign policy, this is all about equality. Also about other members of society who do not have access to equal opportunities. And um, in the case of a feminist foreign and development policy, of course, it is our interest to promote equality around the world. In many countries, women do not have equal opportunities in society. Many countries are suffering from conflicts and the first victims in a conflict are women and children. So it is important for us to work through projects in these countries to promote equality um, for women in particular. And uh, we have devoted quite some considerable financial resources as well to finance these projects which are designed to either reduce or avoid all kind of um, injustices or inequalities that make it impossible for women to have equal opportunities in a society. 
Germany has the largest economy in Europe thanks to its stable legal environment, highly skilled workforce mm. and uh, world-class research. The country's economic success is mainly driven by its small and medium-sized enterprises, commonly referred to as Mittelstand, which account for more than 99% mm -hmm. of the country's companies. What are the key lessons can be learned from German Mittelstand as the model of economic success? Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, um, the Mittelstand, small and medium-sized companies in Germany are extremely important for our economy. And the fact that, that this is uh, well known also internationally is proven by the fact that Mittelstand is uh, broadly understandable around the world as a trademark of German economy. And about 90% of German companies are small and medium sized companies, the Mittelstand, which means they are normally family owned so no public companies listed on the stock exchange. Um, they are normally quite small, although they are big ones like Bosch, for example, a big international company with 300,000 or 370,000 employees worldwide, 70 billion euros turnover worldwide. Uh, and still it's considered to be a company of the Mittelstand because it is family owned. And what makes these companies so special and why are they so important for the German economy? These family-owned businesses are always looking at the long term of development. Not so much focused on short-term profit maximization, but rather product development in the long term and also developing their workforce in the long term. And I just talked about the uh, vocational training system. The small and medium-sized companies in Germany are at the heart of Germany's vocational training system because they supply the majority of vocational um, jobs in companies. They do the training. And this training, again, is then the basis of innovation um, in German uh, companies. And Many of these companies are very innovative. Um, most of them are global players. And many of them are what we call hidden champions. About 2000 German Mittelstand companies are hidden champions, which means in their respective field of technology or the product they produce, they are a world leader, a market leader in their small niche. And um, this innovation um, is only possible because of a very good um, training of the workforce and a long-term perspective of developing the company. Of course, it's also the, the result of, let's say, hard work um, and a sense of loyalty of employees to their employer and vice versa, of the employer caring about his employees like in a family, basically. And this all taken together has produced a very strong economic force that is maybe one of the major reasons why we are talking about products made in Germany today, making them so well known for its quality. Um, and um, it all begins in small and medium-sized companies, the Mittelstand. Finally, I would like to address our traditional question to you as well. What book would you recommend to our viewers and readers mm -hmm. to read? After all the, the hard questions you've asked me this afternoon, maybe this is the hardest because there are so many mm -hmm. books. And of course, I, I love to read. And um, I like to recommend, if you allow two books, not only one. Of course. The one is... Um, a book that was published a hundred years ago in 1924 by the German writer and poet Thomas Mann, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1929 for his trilogy The Buddenbrooks. But in 1924, he published a novel called Der Zauberberg, The Magic Mountain. And uh, this is a book about a young man visiting 
his cousin, in a sanatorium in the Swiss Alps in the mountains. His cousin is ill, that's why he's in the sanatorium, and he's visiting him, and his plan is to visit for three weeks. And early on already, he is kind of drawn into this mountain world and loses all perception of time. And instead of three weeks, he stays for seven years. Mm. The reader is kind of dragged, drawn into this novel, just as the hero of that novel is drawn into this mountain world. And um, that's why it's called the magic mountain. It has a fascination. Um, the Magic Mountain, however, is a novel of about 800 pages. So it is a mountain to climb also for the reader, which in these times with reduced attention spans of people maybe is considered to be uh, quite a challenge. Um, but I would definitely recommend reading it because it opens a fascinating world of, of imagination. Um, in, and in the process, the reader himself or herself is losing the sense of time. So you will not even notice that you have read 800 pages. So the second book. It is a good example of how a German and an Azerbaijani have become friends and have helped each other. There is an Azerbaijani poet called Mirza Shafi Wazey. Mirza Shafi was born in Genje, and um, he spent some years in, in Tbilisi, in Georgia, in the middle of the 19th century, about 1850, where he met a German, Friedrich von Bodenstedt, a young man at the time who uh, was a teacher of German and who was interested in, in everything about the Caucasus. So Mirza Shafi became his teacher in Persian and in Turkish, and he became his friend. And they spent about three years together. And Mirza Shafi uh, produced a lot of poems, but he was only uh, reading and speaking the poems, but he was never writing them down. And Friedrich von Bodenstedt took the pains and wrote them all down. And after three years, when he went back to Germany, he published a book. The poems yeah. and the songs of Mirza Shafi, it became a big success all over Europe, not only in Germany, even in the United States, hundreds of thousands of copies printed, more than 50 reprints of this book. And um, I think it's fair to say that without Mirza Shafi, Nobody really would have known Friedrich von Bodenstedt in Germany. And without Friedrich von Bodenstedt publishing the poems of Mirza Shafi, the world would not have known Mirza Shafi. So the two men met in the 19th century, a time when German immigrants came to Azerbaijan, also in the region of West Azerbaijan, in, in close to Genje, Gögel, Shemkiem, and these places. Annenfeld, as they were called by the Germans. And it was the time where the two countries and people from both countries discovered each other. And it laid a very important foundation also of the relationship between Germans and Azerbaijanis until today. We are very proud of this heritage. We are cultivating it. There's a great German heritage still to be seen in uh, Azerbaijan, including in Baku. And there's this literature, this little piece, this little book with poems by Mirza Shafi, published by a German. And uh, through it, both Mirza Shafi and von Bodenstedt became friends, and they became both very well known. So I can recommend reading these poems, which are all about love and emotions and the beauty of life. and. Um, very nice literature. Thank you very much for your responses and for having this interview. Thank you very much for coming. Thank Please you. come again and read the book.